One thing we forgot to mention was that on the uh, kitchen window table back there are baskets for each of the graduate, uh, graduates. So um, if you would like to uh, uh, drop them a, a note or leave them something, um, feel free to leave it in those. And graduates, make sure you collect um, your, uh, your hull um, as you leave. Um, or it might, well, might wind up in my office and you might know what <laughs> might be missing. So. <laughs> Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I heard it said that a, a graduation ceremony is an event where a commencement speaker tells thousands of students dressed in identical caps and gowns that individual is the key to success. <laughs> Well, my, my other gift to the grads this morning is that as far as my um, normal preaching time, I'm going to be pretty short today. Um, and everybody said amen, right? Um, <laughs> but I want to read a chapter out of Luke chapter 9. And this is a, a message that is um, designed to, to speak to the graduates a bit this morning, but I do believe has application for each and every one of us. Luke 9, 23 through 26, Jesus said, he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose um, to forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed on, of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and his holy angels. Well, as I was looking at this passage, what really jumped off to me this time when I read it, and usually when I read a passage like this, something new jumps out at me every time. But this time it was verse 24. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for me will save it. This seems like an odd statement um, to most people. If you want to try to preserve your life, you will lose your life. But if you're willing to lose your life for me, you will find your life. What Jesus says here illustrates just how upside down the kingdom of God is to the way we think of things a lot of times. Um, That the way God orders things don't work how we think they should work a lot of times. For example, Jesus died in order to win victory. Right? Most of the time, dying means you lost, right? But with Jesus, um, that's, that's victory. Jesus says if you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. But if you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. These are things that just seem upside down to us, but it illustrates that God's kingdom works very different in the world around us. In God's kingdom, it's the meek who inherit the earth. It's the poor in spirit who inherit the kingdom. Those who mourn will be comforted. It's just a very different way of viewing the world, that when we view it through the eyes of the kingdom of God. And in this passage, he says, the way to salvation, the way to true life, is to deny yourself, carry a cross. Now, that's not my natural inclination, right? Deny myself and carry a cross. Um, Jesus says, you must lose your life to find your life. And it got me thinking about the things that we generally define our lives with. And one thing I think that is so vital in the Christian walk is that we define ourselves according to our relationship with God. As I've preached us at length when we went through the Slave the Child series, that our main identity should be that of God's children. That's who he made us to be. And until we find our identity wrapped up in Jesus, we'll never truly experience the life that we were meant to live and that we were created to live. And this morning, as we honor our graduates, I think this is one of the most important things that you guys could catch hold of. I came across an interesting study that basically said... um, You can tell a lot about a society based off of what taxes them mentally. Um, What tends to break people down mentally in your society says a lot about your society. So in the past several hundred years, often what caused kind of that mental breaking point was the pressure of responsibility. Largely because people knew who they were and knew how they fit into the world around them. And so when mental breaks happened, it was largely because of the pressure of living up to that identity. But in, uh, and so basically you, you were born into a story. You knew your name, you knew who you were, 
And if there was a breakdown, it's because you had a hard time living up to that. But now when you look across the board, what is causing our society mental stress are things like depression. So many people are struggling with depression, and maybe it's largely because we do not any longer know who we are or how we fit into the world. We don't see ourselves as part of a story anymore. We don't see where we belong. And so much of the pursuit of young people these days is to forge an identity, discover who they are. And this is where social media has become so toxic. Because on social media, I can put an identity out there for people to see and hope they will affirm that identity by clicking the like button. There is a lot of people who associate their worth with how many likes they get on social media. Studies are showing us more and more that they affirm their worth by how many likes they're getting on the posts they put out there. So if I put out a picture of myself and it gets a lot of likes, I think, wow, this identity is good. I am a good person. People like who I am. But if it doesn't, then the opposite begins to be true. And I think what this shows is as a society, we're struggling with identity. We don't know who we are, and we're depressed because we don't know who we are. And the hope is often to try to find your thing, right? We hear a lot about that. Find your thing. Find that thing you're good at, that thing you love, that thing you can wrap your identity around. And there are a lot of garages full of failed things, (laughs) right? Um, Like sports equipment and hobby equipment and so on. Uh, And so what we need to know is our identity needs to have a deeper anchor than this. And that's one of the reasons why depression is so widespread, because we are wrapping our identity around shallow things. And this affects um, more than just young people and non-Christians, but this is a problem we often have in the church as well. The problem that I often think we have is that there are so many good things out there that give our lives meaning. There are many godly things out there that are part of our lives that are sometimes, they're hard to get past those and how we define ourselves. Because as humans and Christians, we have different things that give our lives meaning. Um, Take careers. Often, when you meet someone for the first time, what's one of the first questions you ask them? So what do you do for a living, right? That's one of the first questions you ask people. What do you do for a living? Because that's a big definition we use for for people. Um, We associate them with what they do for a living. Um, And sometimes that does tell us something. So I meet someone, they tell me they're a carpenter. Well, right there, I begin to form something about them. Okay, they're good at their hands. They're this, they're that, right? Um, And it is a big part of your life because whatever your occupation is, you spend a big portion of your life doing that. We also have relationships. Our spouse is a big part of our lives and how we live. And I've told many people, who you marry is the second most important decision you ever make. First is following Jesus. Your spouse choice is the second one. Um, Who you choose to have this life with, this intimate relationship with, will define your life in a huge way. And often our identity is very wrapped up in who our spouse is, and rightly so in a lot of ways. Many of us are also parents, and certainly having children is a defining moment in your life. The moment they hand you that baby, your life has changed. (laughs) There's a new love.
was and isn't all it's cracked up to be. Um, and so even at that, eventually you retire, and a lot of people struggle with the question, who am I now that I've retired? There are a lot of athletes that struggle with this, that they spend their whole lives revolving around the sport. If you make the pros, you play maybe into your mid-30s, then your body gives out and you can no longer play, well, um, who am I now that this is over? I've seen pastors struggle with this at times. You spend your life pastoring churches, and then it ends, and then who am I now that I don't do that anymore? The same could be said for relationships. Who am I if my spouse passes away or my spouse leaves? We spend a lot of time on our children, and we'll always be their parents, but many struggle with who am I now that they're gone out of the house and they've graduated? What do I do with my life now? This happens when we reach some of our dreams and goals as well. We finally get to that point where we always dreamed of, and all of a sudden we're like, well, now what do I do? I have no goals to pursue. I, I accomplished them. What all this points to is this, that we have to have a deeper anchor to our identity than these secondary things. So let's dive deep into what Jesus said this morning. First one he said is this, we must tr stop trying to save our lives. We must stop trying to save our lives. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Again, this verse goes against everything that the world tells us and turns it upside down. We're taught in order to have the good life, um, in order to find joy and happiness, don't deny yourself at all, but get whatever you want. Take what's yours, preserve everything that makes you happy. But Jesus says, deny yourself if you want to save your life or you will lose it. One of the things I think he means by this is that the more we try to make ourselves happy, the more we try to preserve things exactly how they are and how we like them, the more we'll actually find ourselves becoming enslaved to those things. That's right. And we'll have less and less happiness and joy as time goes on. And so much of this stems from holding on to these secondary identities. We try to hold on to our careers and relationships. We try to hold on to ideas and identities that we've created for ourselves. But, like I said, all those secondary identities, they fade away eventually. And so the more we try to hold on to those, it's a futile exercise. And the more we hold on to them, the more it'll do exactly what we want it to do. It won't make us more happy. It'll make us less and less happy because we're holding on to something that can't be held on to. Right. Just an example, when your children become adults at some point, you have to let them go into the world and forge their own path. The more you try to hold on and refuse to see them and treat them like adults, well, <laughs> the more that relationship is probably going to be strained and cause more stress. As strange as it sounds, the more I try to live for myself, the more empty and empty my life becomes. Right. It's such a strange concept to our world, but it's proven, proven true over and over and over again. The more I make everything in my life about making me happy, the less happy it makes me. Right. And that's because we are made for a different purpose. It reminds me of the parable of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12. Jesus says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store up my surplus of grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. You see, you can spend so much of your life simply storing up things for yourself, hoarding things and doing things that we think will lead to peace, happiness, and joy. But here Jesus says, what good will it truly do you in the end? Because you can spend all that time and effort doing that, but you never know when this life on earth will end. And if it does, what have you accomplished that matters? When you hold on to secondary identities, thinking you are saving your life, you're actually losing your life. Right. You're investing in things that don't last and holding on to things that don't last. And when we lose things that we've made our identity, we become lost and confused and bitter. 
and depressed. Because those things are what we were living for. But Jesus offers a better way. And so, second thing is we must lose our lives in Christ. He says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. We often associate this verse with those who give their lives and are killed and martyred for the kingdom of God, and it certainly applies, but I don't think that's all that Jesus meant here, certainly, but I think it's a deeper meaning than that. What I think he means is that when we give our lives over to him, meaning we're not about self-preservation, getting our own way or pleasing ourselves above others, but we are so wrapped up in Christ, we are serving him, that he is the anchor of our identity, that is where you find true life as it was meant to be lived. Amen. When we try to get our own way and preserve things how we want them and store up treasures in this world, we wind up anxious and disappointed at the outcome. But when we surrender our lives totally over to God and make him our goal, we find peace and joy and fulfillment Amen. in him. When I lose myself in Christ, then at every stage of life, my goals, my identities, my actions are wrapped up in Jesus. Those secondary identities can come and they can go, but they don't change who I am. Right. So when, we, when part of our life passes away and it transitions to something new, our identity isn't lost when that happens, but it just is a matter of our mission is shifting. Someday, when this ride is over um, and I no longer pastor a church, it doesn't mean that the missional part of my life is over. Right. It doesn't mean that um, my identity is in shambles. It simply means I will have shifted missions. That my mission now is taking on a different look. My identity remains the same. I belong to God. And my end is the same. To glorify him and make him known. Losing ourselves in Christ means this. Colossians 3.17, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to the Father through him. Amen. It means Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. It means that I am so identified in Jesus and no matter what stage of life I find myself, whether my kids are young or adults, whether I'm working or retired, whether I'm married or single, it means my primary purpose is knowing Jesus and building his kingdom. Amen. And when we have that mindset that wherever I am and whatever I'm doing, it's about Jesus, it'll help us do those things with excellence. It will give them all a deeper and more rich meaning and when they change, it'll help us face that change without losing our purpose or identity. Right. The truth is, when I lose myself in Jesus, whatever my occupation is, however my family looks, however my finances look, where I'm living, none of those hold sway over who I truly am. Because I am in Christ. I have lost myself to Jesus, and in losing myself, I find true life. unearthly things for you died and your life is now hidden with God when Christ who is your life appears then you will also appear with him in glory it is the upside down way of the kingdom of God try to save your life you will lose your life lose your life for Jesus and you will find your life Amen. my question for us today is am I living out that true or am I holding on to or I'm defining myself by secondary identities? So graduates, over the next few years, you're going to have a lot of things that try to define you. You will have political entities try to define you. You will have other people who try to define you. Your careers will threaten to define you. Whoever you choose to marry at some point can it is a defining moment. But what I want to drive home to you is that none of those are your true 
anchored identity. But find your true identity in Jesus. Anchor yourself in him. Lose your life to him. And the trade-off is so, so worth it. You find true life of his spirit living in and through you. And for the church as well, (laughs) are you defining yourselves by a secondary identity right now? So let's look at the questions that I'd have you consider today. First question is this, what is the primary um, thing giving your life meaning? And what would happen if circumstances change? It might be worth it for us to think about, if I was to say, what is the main thing giving my life meaning right now? What is it? And then the question becomes, is that a secondary identity? Or is it anchored in Jesus? Secondly, in what ways have you tried to save your life and it turned it sucked the life out of you? That's a good thing to think back. I know I can look back at several stages of my life and think, man, I I thought that this was life, and it turned out that it was actually a life sucker in the end. It took way more of my time and energy and thoughts than it should have. And then thirdly, what might need you to surrender in order to lose your life in Jesus? Maybe it is your career. Maybe it is... Um, things to do with your family. What might need you to surrender in order to lose your life in Jesus? My prayer is this, that each and every one of us would know who we are in Christ and that that would be the thing that anchors us no matter what stage of life we find ourselves. Save your life and you will lose it. Lose your life to Jesus and you will find it. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the life that you give. And Father, I pray that that life would be in each and every one of us. And Father, I invite you in my life, and I hope others do as well, to point out those secondary identities that maybe have been taking up too much of who I define myself to be. And instead, Lord, may I give those over to you. And may... My true identity simply be your child. Father, I especially pray for these graduates as they are about to embark on a a different stage of life. Lord, show them the right path. And Lord, I pray most of all, may may they lose their lives in you. And in doing so, may your life be lived through them. And may they discover your true life. You have come that we may have life more abundantly. The abundant life is in you, Father. Father, go before us as we leave today. And may we be lights wherever we go and represent you and be ambassadors of your kingdom. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, make sure you congratulate. I can't talk today. I'm like, (laughs) that, that, that. Congratulate our graduates. Make sure you drop them a card or something and uh, go with him. You are dismissed.